Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Uh, my name is Sam Norris, um, and today I'm very excited to talk about my new work on the effects of incarceration on mortality. Uh, this is joint work with Matt Pachanko and Jeff Weaver. Um, okay, um, now, Incarceration is a really big public policy issue in the US. Uh, so about 9% of uh, American men will be incarcerated at some point in their life. And as a result of the growing recognition that this is important, uh, there's been a flood of work over the last 10 years that have looked at the uh, economic and policy consequences of incarceration. Um, now, most of that work is focused on uh, the effects of incarceration on recidivism as well as economic outcomes like labor force participation. Um, and so we know much less about the health and mortality effects of incarceration. Now, what little we do know uh, suggests that there's negative effects. Uh, mostly this is work in criminology and sociology. Um, and some of it has suggested that incarceration may be a contributor to the black white health gap. Now, when we sat down and started to think about this a little bit more, we realized that we weren't so sure which direction the effects would be going in. Um, so on the one hand, you might think that incarceration increases mortality. Uh, you're putting people uh, in, in a facility with a bunch of other dangerous criminals. Uh, we think that confinement worsens physical health, uh, potentially through worse food, fewer uh, options for physical exercise. Um, and there's overwhelming evidence of uh, negative effects on mental health, particularly for uh, individuals that end up in solitary confinement. Um, and then finally, you might think that um, if incarceration is going to increase the amount of crime that happens after by the um, incarcerated individual, as well as decreased labor force participation, uh, these might indirectly increase mortality in the long run. Now, on the other hand, there's some reasons to think that incarceration could decrease mortality. Um, so uh, prison and jail is the one place in the US where there's a constitutional right to healthcare. Um, and many of the people that end up being incarcerated don't have other access to healthcare um, in their normal lives. Uh, prison is also a very difficult place to get uh, drugs and weapons. And these are things that kill a lot of the population that ends up being incarcerated. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with it being a safer environment. Um, finally, uh, prisons also often uh, drug and alcohol treatment as well as other uh, like behavioral intervention programs. And so conceivably these could continue to uh, have effects after release, lowering mortality. Now, with all this said, the evidence that we have is essentially, uh, for the US at least, is comparing um, the incarcerated people with the general population, potentially adjusting for some covariates. Um, and so to the extent that the controls that we can include in these sorts of regressions don't account for all the differences between uh, the incarcerated and non-incarcerated population, uh, these estimates are going to be biased. And in particular, they're going to make prison look uh, worse for health than it is because this is a relatively high risk population. Um, so what we do in this paper is uh, directly look at this. Uh, we study the effect of incarceration on mortality both during incarceration uh, as well as post incarceration. And to do this, we're going to use a uh, difference in difference type specifications where we observe how mortality changes as prisoners are released from prison. Um, now, to do this, we're going to put together uh, 30 years of court and prison records uh, and link these to death records. So all this is in Ohio. The data comes from the three big counties in Ohio, which are the counties that surround uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus. Um, <clears throat> and so we're able to observe all deaths in, uh, in the So very briefly, uh, what we find is that incarceration has very large effects on mortality. Uh, in particular, while people are incarcerated, mortality declines uh, by 50 to 60%. And, and the effects are biggest in the things that you might expect. So we see many fewer uh, murders, suicides, uh, and overdoses. Um, there's also fewer accidents. It's very difficult to get hit by a car in prison. 
Um, but we also see it in terms of things uh, like more traditionally health-related deaths. So there's fewer deaths from heart disease, for example. Uh, and so we think this is evidence that the healthcare that is provided in prison uh, is actually making a difference in terms of mortality. Um, we also see that the effects have grown over time. And in particular, in the last 10 years, they've gotten much larger. Um, and much of this is due to the opioid epidemic in Ohio. So the protective effect uh, of prison has increased as the risk of overdose outside has increased. Now, we also study the uh, effect of incarceration on post-release mortality. Um, and here we see very little going on. Um, so we don't find much evidence that incarceration increases mortality risk uh, after release, with the perhaps slight exception of uh, some short-term reductions in mortality for medical reasons. And again, this is consistent with uh, incarceration increasing the stock of health and that continuing to have effects even after release. So putting these two things together, we have a decrease in mortality during incarceration not much going on after incarceration. Uh, and this implies that uh, incarceration has led to a lasting increase in lifespan for the affected individuals. <laughs> okay, so the data that we use for this paper, uh, as I said, comes from Ohio, where we have court records for the three largest counties, uh, running from 1990 to 2016. So this is about two and a half million criminal cases, almost a million unique defendants. And we've matched these data uh, to the mortality records uh, for the state using name and date of birth. Now, for each data, or for each case, we have pretty detailed data. And so you should think about this as we know the individual who was charged, we know whether they were incarcerated, and we know for how long they were incarcerated. We also know information like, uh, race, criminal history, um, and, and details of the offense. Um, so we have a pretty good picture of, the, uh, of at least the, the court side of, of what was going on. Um, the mortality records are also quite detailed. Um, so they're every death that occurs in Ohio. And we know the date and the detailed cause of death. And uh, this cause of death is nice because it's going to let us dig into the mechanisms a little bit more and understand why this is happening. Um, we also match the court records to the SSA death master file, uh, which covers all deaths in the U.S., at least for social security holders, um, but only up until 2010 and doesn't give us cause of death. Um, and so we just use that as a robustness check to uh, confirm that looking only at deaths in Ohio doesn't change our results, uh, which is true. Um, but mostly because we have the cause of death data in the Ohio data, uh, that's what we're going to look Now, before I get into the empirical strategy, I want to make a brief pitch for Ohio as a good place to study this sort of thing. Um, so Ohio is fairly similar to uh, the rest of the US in terms of both mortality and incarceration. Um, there's about 790 uh, per 100,000 uh, Ohio adults that are incarcerated. This is close to the national average of 780. Um, and the mortality in Ohio looks similar to the rest of the US. So what I'm showing you here on this graph uh, is the mortality rate per 100,000 inmates on the x-axis and the age-adjusted overall population mortality rate on the y-axis. And we can see that Ohio is uh, pretty much in the middle of that cloud, uh, maybe a slightly higher um, overall mortality rate. Um, so the one important caveat is that um, there's been an opioid epidemic in Ohio. Uh, it's been one of the epicenters in the U.S. And, and this has really picked up steam since about 2010. And, and so I'm going to show you mostly results using all years of data. Um, but if we restrict to the years before 2010, uh, all of the substantive conclusions about uh, heterogeneity and uh, and the types of deaths that are affected, those are all going to remain the same. Um, and at the very end, I'll show you uh, the time series of the effect, which highlights how important the opioid epidemic has been. Um, okay, so the empirical strategy here, 
um, come from what we're chasing. And so the goal here is to estimate two effects. Uh, we're interested in the direct effect, which is how mortality risk uh, is affected during the period of incarceration as well as the post-release effect, which is just asking how having previously been incarcerated uh, affects current mortality. Now, the first thing that we thought about doing and that many of you might have thought about doing um, would be to use uh, uh, randomly assigned judges as an instrument for incarceration, using that uh, quasi-random variation in incarceration to study the effect of incarceration on mortality. And unfortunately, what we found is that um, uh, even in Ohio, where they do randomly assign judges and the instrument is very powerful, um, we're just nowhere close to power to look at the effect on mortality using this sort of instrument. And the issue is that um, even when the effects are this large, mortality is a very rare outcome. Um, and so kind of almost any research design has fairly low power. Uh, so we do some Monte Carlos uh, after we get our effects, and even with effects as large as we find, um, we think that it would take about an order of magnitude more data than has ever been collected for criminal justice research in the US. Um, so instead of using a judge IV approach, um, we turn to difference and difference types approach. Um, and so the core of our strategy is what we call a perspective diff and diff which is to examine how mortality risk changes uh, before and after pre-scheduled releases from prison. We're gonna compare that change to the trend among the non-incarcerated. And something that's really helping us here is that Ohio has um, a determinate sentencing. So when the judge tells you how long you're gonna be incarcerated for when he gives you your sentence, that's almost exactly how long you're gonna be incarcerated for. And so we can compare uh, your mortality just before versus just after uh, you are scheduled to be released. And so this gets us away from issues like uh, if we use the actual release date, you might worry that someone will be released because they're about to die. Here we can uh, take when we think you're gonna be released, conditional on a day in the past, which was the sentencing day, and that's actually gonna be when you're released. Um, the other point I wanna make before I uh, move on is that the other diff and diff that you might think of doing would be a more standard diff and diff based on the onset of treatment. So uh, as the treated people move into incarceration, uh, compare the trend in mortality with people who are not incarcerated. And the issue with this um, uh, is that we know that everyone in the data is alive at the time of sentencing. And so by construction, both the incarcerated and non-incarcerated groups are not dead before they move into prison. Um, and so the standard diff and diff would just collapse to comparing the mortality between the incarcerated and the non-incarcerated. Um, and so uh, what we're stuck with is this perspective diff and diff where we look at the changes in mortality before and after release. Okay, so um, this perspective diff and diff approach uh, solves some problems, but it creates others. Um, and the easiest way to think about uh, what's going on um, is just to look at a potential outcomes framework. Uh, so we, we've written down a simple one where we have uh, two periods, uh, period zero and period one, and a treatment and control group. The treatment group is incarcerated in period zero, uh, but has been released in period one. And the control group is not incarcerated in either. So we denote uh, potential outcomes using this notation. Uh, so potential outcomes are a function of the period, um, the history of potential treatment. So this is gonna allow us to uh, understand um, the post-release effects. So the history of potential treatment is just the treatment um, in period zero and period one. And then D here denotes the actual treatment. So an example of this, this uh, Y1111 would be the period one outcome for a treatment individual who is incarcerated in period zero, uh, but not period one. Now, this is something we would actually observe, but obviously not all the quantities that we could write down in this potential outcomes notation um, are gonna be something that we could potentially observe. 
So with that in hand, we can be uh, sharp about what the target parameter is, uh, which for us is the average treatment on treated effect of incarceration on mortality. So this is just the effect of uh, being incarcerated for the population that actually was incarcerated at the time they were incarcerated. Now, we're going to use uh, what you can think of as the backwards diff and diff to estimate this. So uh, this top quantity, the beta hat, is just the uh, average mortality uh, when incarcerated for the incarcerated people minus average mortality uh, when they are released, and then subtracting off that same time trend for the non-incarcerated. So this is exactly the standard diff and diff, just run backwards in time. And we can do some substitutions. And this second line on the slide is showing you that we can decompose it into three different quantities. And um, so in expectation, this estimator is going to uh, deliver the average treatment untreated, beta ATT. And um, this second term uh, that is the analog of the parallel trends assumption. So it's just requiring that um, if the treatment and or treated an untreated group were not treated, that they'd be on the same trend in terms of outcomes over time. Um, and then finally, the third quantity uh, in this expression is the post-release ATT. And so this is just the effect of uh, incarceration um, on outcomes after release among the incarcerating group. Um, <clears throat> okay. And so putting it down in this form makes it clear um, exactly when we can expect to get what. And so in particular, if we have parallel trends and no post-release effects, um, this approach is gonna give us the average treatment untreated. Um, it also tells us that if prison acts in the same way in terms of mortality, both during incarceration and after release, that means that the post-release ATT uh, and beta ATT of the same sign, then the estimate that we get out of this is gonna be a conservative estimate for ATT. Okay, um, so to actually estimate this, we're gonna use uh, all the periods of data rather than just the first two, or the two around release. Um, and so we're gonna run this on a quarter level panel uh, where we're gonna restrict the data to all the data that's post decision. So that means that the date of release has already been decided uh, and all the individuals who are still alive. Uh, we're then gonna regress whether or not the individual dies, on that dies in that quarter and on whether or not they were sentenced to be incarcerated, uh, plus whether or not they were sentenced to be incarcerated and have yet to be released. Uh, and then we're gonna condition on a bunch of controls. So those include things like uh, criminal history and current charges. Uh, plus fixed effects for um, the quarter, the age of the individual, uh, and the court month. Um, so these age and time fixed effects uh, hopefully account for any differential trends in mortality. Um, and, and we're going to two-way cluster uh, the standard errors by individual and court month. So Comparing this back to the potential outcomes framework, uh, what we expect to get out of this, um, the thing that we're most interested in is beta, which is going to correspond uh, with some weighting issues to beta ATT. Um, and then the secondary object that we're interested in is alpha. So alpha here is just the difference in mortality in the post-release periods between the formerly incarcerated and uh, the formerly non-incarcerated. So what we show is that this is equal to the sum of both the post-release effects and any baseline differences in mortality between the incarcerated and non-incarcerated. Now, to the extent that we think that the incarcerated people have higher baseline mortality, this, might, this means that uh, alpha is an upper bound on any post-release effects. So here are the main results. Um, so what we find is that incarceration dramatically reduces mortality. Um, so from a baseline uh, post-release mean of uh, 622 deaths per 100,000 individuals, uh, being incarcerated in a particular quarter decreases mortality by 365. So this is a reduction of about 
Um, this is just a really dramatic reduction in mortality. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is that the alpha coefficient, we can't reject that, that thing is zero. And in any case, it's very small. Now, to the extent that we think that um, alpha is an upwards biased estimate of any post-release effects, um, this suggests that the post-release effect is non-positive at least, so zero at the most. Um, and so what we're seeing here is something that's consistent with incarceration dramatically reducing mortality while someone is incarcerated, and then having potentially small uh, or causing potentially small reductions in mortality after release. Um, the next thing that we do is we look at all the different causes of death. So here I'm showing you the results for overdose, murder, uh, medical type deaths, accidents, and suicides. And what we see is that the reductions in mortality are widespread. Um, so in almost all or in all the categories of death, uh, we see reductions on the order of 20 to 100% uh, in terms of mortality. The largest reductions are concentrated in uh, murders and suicides where the reduction is like on the order of uh, 100%. I'm gonna, in contrast to what we may think, it's actually very difficult to get murdered in prison. Um, and I think that what is, Sorry, and so these are the things that we might think the effect might be largest in, um, but we also see effects in medical. Um, and so the reduction in medical type deaths is about 20% uh, uh, off a baseline of 251. Um, and so this is still a relatively big reduction in mortality. If we drill into that a little bit more, here I'm showing you the same graph, except for the causes of medical deaths broken out, um, we can see that this is concentrated in um, heart disease, uh, which is somewhat surprising, but it might just reflect um, that people receive uh, drugs, to, drugs to treat heart disease uh, while incarcerated. We don't see much going on for cancer, which is kind of consistent with this being a longer term, more difficult to treat disease. Um, and then we see reductions uh, in infections, potentially just because uh, there's medical personnel in the prison immediately there uh, that can treat potential issues as they arise. Um, okay, so the next thing that we wanted to do was uh, look a little bit more at the dynamics. Um, and so um, what we're doing here is we're estimating a event study style specification um, where we're regressing whether or not someone died on the same set of controls and fixed effects, but instead of uh, the two dummies, we're just um, interacting whether or not someone was ever incarcerated with all the different times relative to release. Um, so we're estimating this at the half year level, so there'll be uh, 29 coefficients, where the lambdas uh, for S less than one are gonna correspond to the difference in mortality between the incarcerated and non-incarcerated before release. Uh, so those would correspond to beta. And uh, lambda where S is positive corresponds to the difference in mortality between the incarcerated people who've been released and the people who are never incarcerated. Um, and so that corresponds to alpha. Now, this is gonna be useful because uh, we can use it both to look for parallel trends um, so we'll be able to examine whether or not there's similar trajectories, both before and after. Um, and then we can also uh, look for um, more evidence in terms of post-release effects. So if there were post-release effects, we think that the most likely pattern they would take would be that prison would have a larger effect on post-release mortality immediately after release, and then it would fade out. Um, and so if we see that the effect of, or that the difference between um, the incarcerated and non-incarcerated mortality is largest just after release versus uh, long after release, this will be evidence of some sort of post-release effect. Now, here are the results. Um, and what we see is evidence of uh, extremely flat pretrends and no evidence of any sort of fade up. Um, so first, uh, in terms of parallel trends, we see that the difference in mortality between the incarcerated and non-incarcerated is roughly constant 
um, in all the years before and after release. Uh, this is particularly important in, with the post release because we see again that those coefficients are all flat in the years after, uh, suggesting that we don't have a post release effect that fades out over time. And so this is again consistent with uh, zero or uh, slightly weaker non positive post release effects. Um, Okay, uh, the next thing we do is we estimate the effect uh, of incarceration over time. So here we just interacted our main specification with the year of release. Um, and when we do this, we can see that the opi opioid epidemic has been uh, really important in terms of the protective effect of incarceration. Um, so from the early aughts to 2016, the last year of our data, um, the effective incarceration on mortality has increased from decreasing it by the 300 per 100,000 uh, to about 600 per 100,000. And if we drill in and look at the effect on overdoses, we can see that there was about no effect on overdoses in the early 2000s uh, up till about uh, the late aughts. And then it's been steadily increasing since then uh, with an especially large spike in 2016. Um, okay, uh, I want to conclude just by talking about some robustness stuff that we do. Um, the primary data source, as I said, is Ohio, or is deaths that occur in Ohio. Uh, we can also use deaths all across the U.S. Uh, up until about 2010. Here we find very similar results. Um, you might worry that uh, individuals are incarcerated on other charges in the future, uh, so we can slightly tweak this and use the release date as an instrument for not being incarcerated. When we do this, we see the estimates are about 20% larger, but all the substantive conclusions are the same. Um, as I mentioned, we could think about instrumenting with judge assignment. Um, we do so, and our estimates um, include the effects that we estimate, um, but they're much uh, too imprecise to ever be uh, useful. And the Monte Carlos indicate that this is gonna be true uh, to a first approximation, no matter how much data we collect. Um, finally, uh, there's been some work about mortality displacement, um, and so you might think that um, the reduction in mortality is uh, taking deaths that would have occurred uh, at some point in the future, or that is pushing deaths that would have occurred during the period of incarceration and pushing them into the future. Um, we don't see much evidence of that in the event study that I showed you. If we look at it at a more granular level by week, uh, what I'm showing you here is just the raw counts of um, number of deaths uh, by week relative to release. Um, overall, we don't see much going on. That's the blue line. If we look at overdose deaths specifically, we do see an elevated risk of overdose death in that first week uh, of release. Um, but at the end of the day, there just aren't enough overdose deaths here to substantively impact the conclusions. Um, okay, so that's essentially the paper. Um, it's a very short paper with a clear message. Uh, what we find is that incarceration reduces mortality while incarcerated. Um, and we find very little evidence that it affects post-release mortality one way or the other. If anything, it seems to slightly decrease it. Um, we find also that the benefits are larger for the deaths of despair population, so middle-aged white men, um, but there's big effects for all groups. Uh, so putting this together, it seems that incarceration probably isn't a cause of the black-white mortality gap. Um, now, it turns out that this is, or that incarceration is substantively important in terms of explaining the number of deaths in the US. So if we extrapolate our numbers to the entire country, um, we estimate that incarceration leads to about 1,800 fewer deaths per year because the average person entering prison is about 30 um, and there's no catch up after release. These lead to fairly long term increases in lifespan uh, and reductions in mortality. Um, we also find that this is most concentrated among um, opioid deaths, or this is one of the main mechanisms that this works through. Um, 
So we find that uh, opioid deaths will be about 7% higher without incarceration in the U.S., um, which sounds like a big number, but it turns out that about 60% of uh, people who die of an opioid overdose in Ohio have been criminally justice involved at some point before. Um, so I think that the, the last thing that I want to mention um, is in terms of the overall policy takeaway here um, is first that uh, incarceration is, is costly and is obviously not a public health policy response. Um, and so in terms of thinking about the importance of our results, what we think is the most striking thing here um, is that it, incarceration is a very short term intervention. Um, but it's one that changes the environment to make it in, in many ways safer. And so the striking thing that we think is coming out of these results is that this short term intervention in terms of making um, the environment safer for people averts deaths right then. And then there's no catch up later. And so it suggests that other types of public health interventions uh, that um, push off an overdose or uh, keep people safe from violence in the very short term could also have long-term effects in terms of uh, increasing lifespan and keeping people safe. Uh, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, so I think Mike is going to um, provide some Mike Light's going to provide some discussion, and in and as Mike is doing that, you can also feel free to start uh, looking over any of the comments that were in the chat. Um, if you if you have those in front of you, Sam, also. Oh, yes, I will. Uh, okay. Uh, great. Yes, I see. Thank you. Great. Okay. Perfect. So. Uh, Yes. So th thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, first of all, let me just say I really appreciate uh, the invitation. I also appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about this paper. Um, I thought it was really interesting and I uh, particularly uh, appreciated the one. It's a very unique data source you guys have. And I think you guys uh, it's very empirically rigorous. So it was um, it was a lot of, of fun to get to engage it. So some of the questions here, this actually juxtaposes really well. So some of the questions in the sort of chat box here are somewhat specifics to the empirics, um, which um, I think are uh, very, very important. I'm going to keep my comments a little bit more, um, I, to some extent, a little bit broader. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to uh, hit on, and I guess I just want, or I wanted to talk about, and then I wanted to sort of, um, I'd be interested to hear your responses, Sam, so I'm going to try and keep them fairly brief, is one just thinking about how your result, like how do we think about uh, the, the results from this paper in the context of prior work in this area? And I'm going to sort of paint prior work in this area fairly broadly. So in one sense, um, your results actually, I think, agree with uh, quite a bit of the work in this area. And what I mean by that is that is the sort of the short-term health benefits of incarceration. So uh, research by Jason Schnitger, and I believe it's Andrea John um, in 2007, uh, they essentially found uh, um, this same phenomenon. They said, you know, incarceration is linked to short-term health increases. Um, then of course they find it's linked to long-term health consequences, which I'll return to in a moment. Um, Evelyn Patterson's work essentially found the same thing. Now hers was a little bit different. What she found was that, um, particularly for uh, young black men, incarceration seems to be, uh, um, though when they're incarcerated, uh, it seems to be beneficial, uh, largely because they're uh, not being murdered. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think your results are consistent with um, the work in this area, um, or at least some of the work in this area. And I think the so in terms of the thinking about the health benefits of being incarcerated, um, you know, I, I do think there's some research that, that you know, your, you, your estimates and, and, you know, your arguments certainly align with. So I'm not sure that part is totally inconsistent. I, you know, there's a line in there somewhere, and I forget, it's paraphrasing that, you know, against conventional wisdom. And so my, my reading of the literature wasn't quite, uh, um, what wasn't just sort of quite where, where, where that, that, uh, uh, um, writing was. But I, the thing I think uh, I, I, I have to imagine that as you uh, get, I don't know if you've presented this before, that where there's at least a, 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 a pause is the sort of the post-release effects that are uh, um, at, at a minimum, I'm, I'm trying to square with some of the research that we know here, or at least that we thought we know. Um, and so 
one of the things we can talk about is um, there's research to suggest that incarceration is linked to infectious diseases. So even though we know that this is a group that was already had high rates of infectious diseases going into prison, um, there's certainly work to suggest that it's linked to uh, higher rates of infectious diseases from having been incarcerated. Um, uh, there's research by Stephen Raphael and Rucker Johnson suggesting that the incarceration boom was linked to the uh, spread of HIV. There's other public health research suggests it was linked to uh, spread of tuberculosis. There's quite a bit of research to suggest that there is a, a host of sort of uh, social uh, disadvantages that come with being incarcerated. Those disadvantages can, are there's quite a bit of research suggests it's linked to health problems. So, for example, marriage, jobs, um, income. Um, so, for example, I was just looking at an article by Sean Bushway and uh, colleagues uh, using essentially the same setup using judge random assignment um, to look at the post, essentially the effects of incarceration. What they find is that um, uh, the sort of the employment uh, effects of incarceration are highest amongst whites who had a pre-sentence work history. Um, so what they find is that, you know, it decreases employment stability, um, uh, uh, increases uh uh, work inside the secondary labor market. Um, this research suggests that whites uh, are forced to move to worse off neighborhoods after incarceration. So I guess, so that's probably my, uh, one of my sort of biggest comments is just trying to think about how do we sort of square the, the, these two bodies of work. Um, and then I probably, I just want to, I probably have a little bit. And then I guess the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I want to leave as much time for the other participants is thinking about the role of time period. Um, and again, you touch on this a little bit. I mean, so one of the things I was reading about was, um, so some of the work that I was just referencing, some of that uses the NLSY 79, right? So this is a very, so the, essentially the, the context of incarceration was very different, but moreover, the context of not being incarcerated was very different. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, so obviously you're comparing the incarcerated population to being not incarcerated. And essentially if being not incarcerated, if that sort of, uh, uh, sort of environment gets so bad, then you could expect um, uh, uh, not a very big, uh, or you, you could expect a, a, a more beneficial effect of incarceration while people are incarcerated. And obviously part of your guys' data is covering really the, it's certainly one, a, a dramatic increase in opioid death. So again, I think you kind of talk about that, but I'm more thinking about is, is time period part of the reason why you may be getting different results as opposed to, um, you know, uh, 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 um, differences in necessarily just the empirics. Does that make sense? So I, I guess a way to think about that is let's just say, let's just roll your guys' data back, you know, 20 years prior. Um, would you expect to see the, the same results? So I, so that may be one way to think about it in terms of, so I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And I apologize. I know I just threw quite a bit at you, but seven minutes isn't too long. And again, I just wanted to leave quite a, uh, as much time as possible for the other participants. So again, I really appreciated the paper and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, so those are a lot of good thoughts. And so let me, let me respond uh, in, a, in a couple chunks to them. Um, and so I think the, the first thing that you raised, which I think um, is important, is just how we think about what we do relative to what other people have done. And so we think of the big contribution here is, um, so most other work has done some sort of fancy score matching or OLS comparison of incarcerated people and non-incarcerated people. Um, and so what we have here is uh, like a panel research design that we think does a better job of uh, accounting for the fact that people that end up being incarcerated have different attributes that likely make them more likely to die. And so I think that you're right that the direct effects that we find um, the evidence, so some people find that incarceration is protective while people are incarcerated. Some people have found that it is not, and it kind of varies based on the demographic group and the period that is studied. Um, but it's true, that there, there, there are certainly papers that find the same thing that we find. Um, and I mean, in some ways that's great news. Um, we think that the contribution here is that uh, our critical strategy is a little bit more sophisticated. And so, we're more likely to believe these results. Um, but of course, this is something that, that other people have found. Um, this stuff about the post-release effects, as you say, what we find is quite different from what other people in the literature have found. Um, and so there's, there's two points that I want to make, or three maybe. 
Um, so the first is that mostly what we're looking at is relatively short-term changes in mortality. So what we're showing is that having been incarcerated doesn't seem to have an effect on mortality over what it should be. It is seven years, we've extended it out to 15 years, and we still don't see much. Um, it is conceivable that um, some of the health effects of prison could actually take longer than that to show up. So in particular, uh, like HIV is very, so in the post-retroviral era, so since 1997, HIV is very unlikely to kill someone within 10 years, even 15 years. Um, and so you could still be in a world where people are getting HIV in prison. It's just not showing up in mortality uh, data in that 15 years. Is that so bad? Obviously, yes. Um, but it's just, it's not something that this empirical strategy is going to be able to say anything about. Um, it's also possible that like, uh, other types of health condition like hypertension from a bad diet are something that are going to show up later. Um, and yeah. Um, and so that is something that also this empirical strategy just wouldn't say much about. Um, the other set of comments that I want to focus on is this stuff about the time period, which um, I agree is like pretty interesting and pretty important. And so there's this large set of work that looks at uh, like um, HIV and other communicable diseases. Um, the vast majority of the data that we have here is for people that are released after 1997 when antiretrovirals anti became available. And so really you should think about this data as being almost entirely after the, or after the HIV epidemic and of course also before uh, coronavirus. Um, and so I just think that that we're kind of the data that we have here is in between these two big uh, epidemics that affect people in prison. And it's certainly possible that you would see different effects in uh, different time periods. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Michael, uh, for those comments and for those references. And those are something that, that I'm going to take a look at. Um, Okay, um, so how are we doing for time? I see lots of great okay. questions here. Um, I, I, can just I think you have a few more. I think you have, uh, you know, four or five more minutes and really any of them that appeal to you to either, you know, to add information on, you know, feel free to choose that one first and we'll, we can handle some of the other ones in the author room later. Um, okay, great. Um, um, so, okay, so there's a first set of questions from David and Dan that's about um, alternative margins, so about people either being incarcerated or being um, uh, on probation or on some other sort of criminal justice uh, control. And so we actually observe probation, and so we can include that as another counterfactual condition. Um, and we see no difference in uh, mortality between being on probation versus not. And so, um, although of course what we're actually reporting here is a combined estimate of the effect of being incarcerated versus all this other stuff, it turns out that all this other stuff is approximately the same effect. And so we should think about the important distinction as incarcerated versus not incarcerated. Um, Uh, okay, Ellie has a question about um, Ohio pay, or uh, Ohio prisons. Um, Ohio does have private prisons. Uh, I think they have one during uh, the end of this time period, so it is possible. Uh, unfortunately, we don't actually observe the prison that people are in, um, and so we're not able to say much about that. Um, Hanka recommends um, a very nice uh, Helmorsa, Randy, and Lindquist paper uh, that's about the health effects of prison. And so this does something, um, it's a slightly different research sign, but it's almost the exact same question about the effect of the length of incarceration on um, long-term health in Sweden. And so I'd recommend that people also check that out. Um, Jason has a question about um, showing specifications that would more closely match the previous literature. I think that that's a great idea. Um, I think that's a great idea. 
Um, and so that is something that we haven't done, but that's certainly something that we can approximate. Um, and so I think that that would be, that would be a nice contribution. Um, Dan asks about house arrest and that is actually something that we have not thought about. And so the question here is if there's house arrest, uh, in the data, we could think about that as having many of the protective benefits of incarceration with, uh, fewer costs. Um, I will have to check to see whether we observe that in the data. It would be interesting if we did, just because it would help us get it, uh, which of the mechanisms that are happening in prison. Um, so kind of the bundle of being kept out of the world that can be dangerous versus extra access to healthcare, uh, which those margins are actually firing. Uh, so that's a great idea, uh, and that's something that I'll look at. Um, Um, okay, and then I see one question uh, from Ponka that is about um, the cause of death estimates being um, endogenous uh, due to sentence length. Um, so the, the, I think the, the point is just that um, people who are in prison on drug charges are there for less time um, and they are likely uh, there for shorter sentences than violent crime. And so she's wondering if it's something about the sentence length that is affecting uh, the, the type of death uh, that we observe. Um, so this is something that's difficult to rule out. We don't find any evidence that the effects are different for different lengths of sentences. And as you saw, we see that the effect on mortality is the same at all periods pre-release. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a... a surprising econometric thing, but we're seeing something that looks close to constant effects, um, kind of all individuals in the data for all different sentence lengths uh, for most different demographic groups. Um, and so we think that that is, it's kind of surprisingly the, the framework that we look at that through. Um, okay, so I, um, I hope that I didn't miss any comments. Uh, if I did though, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys in uh, the breakout room and hopefully uh, we can have some more nice discussion about this. So thank you all for these comments. Uh, these were great. These have given us some good ideas. Um, and so thank you, it's been a great audience. <laughs>